um, good evening. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us. I'm just going to check that you can see, uh, just to check that it's all okay and you can see me. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the How To Academy and so pleased that despite live book tours and events being cancelled, um, thanks to the technical wonders of Zoom, although I probably shouldn't say that too early on, um, we're able to still hold events and get together in this way. Uh, and there are of course so, still so many wonderful books out there that need discussing uh, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome and be in conversation with Kylie whose novel is certainly one of the most compelling uh, and talked about novels out there. And um, such a fun age, as I put it in front of the screen, uh, the inspiration of course for our event this evening was an instant New York Times and then Sunday Times bestseller uh, and the film and TV rights have already been acquired by the Emmy award-winning screenwriter and producer and actress uh, Lena Waithe. Um, which is pretty remarkable for a debut novel, but the great buzz around it is not in the smallest bit surprising. Uh, it's such a genuinely wonderful read. Uh, it's fun and satirical and very sharply observant, full of empathy, fantastic characters, and just very, very poignant and pertinent and real. And I love this line from the Stylist Review, which is if you want a book that bites into the zeitgeist, then spits it out with gusto, Kylie Reid has you covered with this debut. Funny, piercing and satirical. It explores everything from race to prejudice to getting things wrong when you are trying to do the right thing. It's brilliant. I'm sure that most of you have already uh, raced through it, but if you haven't, um, we'll try not to spoil the ending or anything as we go through the next hour. Um, and just to, for those of you who don't know, therefore, it's a novel which explores the power imbalance between a wealthy white woman, Alex Chamberlain, Alex Chamberlain, uh, and her part-time babysitter, who is a 25-year-old 25 25-year-old black woman called Amira. Uh, and it's all about the race and class fault lines and the messy dynamics of privilege that this relationship exposes. But, um, and all of it begins with a very powerful initial scene and I know you don't want to hear about any of this from me. Uh, I will try and speak as little as possible in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, and you will all have a chance to ask questions at the end. But Kylie, thank you so much for joining us. And I know you've been asked to do this probably at the start of every interview, but just by way of introduction, can you tell us um, about that gripping opening scene and, and about such a fun age? Absolutely. And that was such a wonderful intro. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to chat. Uh, I'll start from the beginning. So in the first chapter, we meet Amira Tucker. She is a 25 year old babysitter who has graduated from Temple University about two years prior. And she's in that phase where she doesn't really know what she wants to do with her life, but she loves babysitting and she's kind of living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, but she does have a really great group of girlfriends and she loves the child that she babysits. And so one night she's out with her friends, they're at a party, they're having fun. When Alex Chamberlain uh, calls her and says, I'm so sorry, but we've had an emergency. Can you please take Briar, their three-year-old, to the grocery store? And Amira is a no position to turn down the extra cash. And so she says, okay, of course. So she takes young Briar to a grocery store with her friend Zara. They're having fun. They're dancing to Whitney Houston. Um, Briar, uh, Zara leaves for a second and it's just Amira and Briar and they're looking at the items in the grocery store until a security guard and a customer upon seeing a black woman with a white child accuse her of kidnapping the child. She's obviously humiliated and another customer pulls out his cell phone and records the entire thing. And it's a high tension moment of not knowing if this is going to become one of those videos that we often see on the news um, until Mr. Chamberlain arrives and, and sets the night right. And so from there, it turns into a bit of a comedy of good intentions as Alex tries to right the night's wrongs and, and almost gets what some people call a friend crush on Amira, uh, which happens, we're all guilty of it. Uh, but the line between employer and employee definitely gets a little a little tricky, especially when Amira and Alex find out that they have something in common. So that's all I'll say on the yeah. plot. <laughs> um, and you said it, it is, it, it's, it is humorous. And you have this um, title, such a fun age. It's a kind of fun title. It's a very colorful, fun looking book, but uh, it's obviously very, 
pretty ironic because actually none of your characters are having much of a fun time. They're struggling a little bit, yeah. I think Amira's definitely in that phase where she's like, I should be having more fun than I am and, and what do I need to do to get there? So I think that's right. And did you intentionally want the title to be sort of ironic? Did you want people to not know what they were getting when they opened the book? Oh, of course. Well, I, I mean, yes, I love a title that has so many meanings. And so that was definitely intentional. Um, I was a nanny for six years. Um, I'm definitely nothing like Amira, but I definitely know that really funny part of your 20s when you're broke and don't really know what you want to do. And as a nanny, that was something that I heard all the time. It was kind of a trite phrase that people would say when you meet someone else and they have a child and you say, oh, how old is she? Oh, 18 months. Oh, that's such a fun age. And it's kind of like, yeah. you know, asking someone about the weather, which is really funny to be talking to you now because I remember that we were concerned that uh, the British uh, audience would not know that phrase. And I heard from many people, oh, we say that all the time. Yes, <laughs> that is something. Um, I want to come back a little bit to your own experiences and, and how they played into the book, but just to stick with the, the idea that it is very humorous and satirical and in many ways. And, and you, you do use, and obviously intentionally, a quite familiar construct of a, of a black caregiver and a white woman and, and a white child and, and, and the dynamics in those instances. But, you do it with a lightness of, of, of touch. And do you think that uh, it's sometimes better to explore these deeper subjects through satire uh, to get people to listen? Mm, that's a really good question. I have to say, and this is not a cop out, I promise. I love, you know, obviously there are many satirical elements in my book of poking fun at theories of feminism or being friends with someone or, or uh, you know, intentions of wokeness. There's definitely a lot of uh, parts poking fun at those things. At the same time, my first priority is always the story. I just want a gripping story where you forget about everything else. And I think that the best satire can either be read looking for the satire or just read for the story. Um, if the plot isn't pulling you along, I think that the satire won't work. And so in going into it, um, of course, I love making fun of things. It's my favorite thing to do, but the plot is always at the forefront. Yeah, and, and I mentioned obviously at the beginning that you had it was an extraordinary reaction that, that, you, that you've had and such a buzz around it. Did you expect anything like that as a oh, result? <laughs> no, not at all. Not, not at all, which actually really touched me because it's such a, a low to the ground domestic story. You know, it's not the Da Vinci Code or Star Wars or anything like that. It's, it's a very, you know, homey story about, you know, really almost petty grievances against people. And, and so I was so, you know, thrilled, like on a selfish level that people are interested in the same petty instances that I'm interested in. But I think it also shows that racism shows up in the tiniest places. And I know, you know, I think most Black Americans have these really big instances of racism against them. But I know from personal experience, the ones that stick with you are the teeny tiny little things of when someone says, you know, oh, you're so articulate or something. And you're like, wait a second, <laughs> why would you say that to me? Those things. And so I was really interested in how those teeny tiny instances affect people. And I'm so glad that those small instances had a big impact. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you obviously said that Amira, who's the main character, one of the two main characters, um, isn't based around you, but you were alluding just a moment ago to the fact that you did gain some of the insight from your own experiences. I think you were a part-time babysitter, as you say. I mean, how much of it is, have you put, gained from your own experience? I think the, the feeling of working in someone else's home, I wouldn't have been able to tap into that unless I had those years of nannying. Um, I've definitely had years without healthcare while I was nannying and the fear that comes from that of, you know, playing with the child and having fun, but knowing, you know, if you break your ankle or something, it's going to change the course of your life because it's going to be hundreds if not thousands of dollars to fix it. So I think it was easiest to tap into Amira's anxiety around paying for her life and her rent and all of those things without having health insurance and also feeling like she was late to adulthood as her friends start to get, you know, promotions and, and serious relationships. Um, but I also think that that's kind of a universal thing. I think Alex too feels late to owning who she is in a little bit. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that all of the children that I babysat, you know, they were so 
odd and serious and curious in a very adult way. And that was something that I brought in that I definitely wanted to put into Briar. And so um, I think that, you know, even though Amira and I are so different, I think that all the experiences I had really colored her, her experience in the novel. It's really interesting. I was going to come to that later, but you do, it's, it, it is so much more than just race. And you write exactly as you say about that very awkward time when you've left university and friends are all moving at different speeds through their careers. Uh, Amir is incredibly worried about paying rent. She's very, very worried about her health insurance and her friends are su supposedly going faster than her. You write very well. And I'm sure a lot of people relate to that extraordinary, there's a lot of competition there. She's very envious when her friend gets a promotion. She can hardly bring herself to congratulate her. She struggles for sure. But you know, I feel like we've all been there a little bit where we say, well, wait a second, I worked really hard too. Like, why don't I have this opportunity? And I think that that's a trick that capitalism does. It, it makes you think that it's your fault that you haven't put yourself in the right position rather than reminding you, you know, this girl's dad got her an internship or this person's um, parents will help her, you know, stay in school or, or whatever it is. And, and that 20s period is so funny. I remember, I don't know if this is the same for you. When I was in my mid 20s, I remember your friends start getting married, which is really exciting. And then they ask you to be a bridesmaid, which is even more exciting. And then it's like, oh, we're all buying this dress and going to this place. And, and, I, and you're just like, wait, what? <laughs> How are we paying for this? Um, and it seems like you've done something wrong to not set yourself up for those experiences. Absolutely. I mean, so talking about those experiences and, and the career that has led you to, to where you are, um, before we go back to, to the book, you, you, this is obviously your debut novel, as I mentioned, but you're a highly experienced writer. You've got a Master of Fine Arts from Iowa Writers Workshop, um, and you were awarded a Truman Capote Fellowship there and taught creative writing. Um, initially, you had a hard time, is that right, getting in? <laughs> I feel like most writers had a few years of, of, you know, constantly questioning, is this worth it? Is this worth it? Because so much of writing, and I think so much of the important years of writing is working other jobs while you write when you have free time. And so I was a nanny for a long time. Um, I wanted to take writing a little bit more seriously. And so I got a job as a receptionist. And the biggest pull for that was knowing that I would be at work from 8.30 to 5.30, but like those were the hours and that was it. I didn't want to be um, someone like a bartender who doesn't know when their, when their shift is going to end. I wanted to know exactly when I was working. And so I would write every Friday night after work for about six hours. And it comes with a lot of saying no to people and people not understanding and saying, you know, why can't you hang out? It's not like you have a due date or anything. And, and there are many nights where it's just like, you know, if you have like a bad write, night of writing, it's like, well, why am I doing this? Um, and I applied to grad school for one year. I got rejected from nine schools. There were tons of other rejections from literary journals. But the way I look at it now is that all of that writing is informing your writing in the future. You start getting used to your bad habits, your tendencies and what you are good at. Um, and so, of course, now I'm glad for those years, but in the time that it's happening, it's very difficult. And it just feels like, you know, maybe I should just do what my friends are doing, and get another job that wouldn't make me as happy. Um, and so I do, you know, I have a respect for Amira for not selling out in that way and just saying, well, this kid makes me happy. So let me, let me try and do this as long as I can. There's certainly empathy there, empathy for Amira, but... Um, I've heard you say in other interviews, and I feel this strongly in the book, that Alix is not a character that you are lacking entirely um, with empathy for. And she's a really complex, fascinating character. I know that you wrote diaries, didn't you, for your characters in order to prepare yourself. So, so looking at Alix, I mean, there's a lot going on. And there's a lot. <laughs> you know, she's a, cr a character that makes you wince and, and cringe, and she just tries, as you've said, so hard. But would you say that it's well-intentioned? You, you wouldn't describe her as a, a bad person? You know, I wouldn't really describe most people as bad people, but I think it's really important to understand that good intentions can cause terrible, harmful ramifications. And so, some, you know, I, and I understand the question that gets asked is, is she a bad person or does she have good intentions? But I think it, the focus has to be on impact versus intent. And if those good intentions are hurting someone, then they're ultimately bad actions. Um, at the same time, you know, the more energy that I put towards 
um, you know, saying Alex is bad takes energy away from the systems that allow her to be this way. And, you know, Alex has this job that, you know, focuses on letter writing and, and some people would say that's not a real job. And, but in my opinion, it's not that she has this kind of silly job. The bigger problem is that Amira couldn't have a job like that. You know, if Amira was sending people letters saying, you should do this with your company, they might look at her photo and say, who are you to tell me this? And I think that's the real problem here. Um, and so, you know, everything that I want for Amira in this novel is, or things that I want for Alex, which is a job that makes her feel like she's a part of a community, healthcare, a house that's not, you know, covered in mold and, and friends and, and family to support her. I think they both deserve those things. Um, but Alex has free will just like everyone else. And I think those good intentions lead her down a bad road a lot. So let, I'm gonna carry on with her because she's, she is just fascinating. And um, you write so well what's going on in, in her mind. There's, there's one, one bit, I just quote it back to you. Alex, Alex, very important to pronounce it like that. <laughs> Alex, Alex fan, fantasized about Amira discovering things about her that shaped what Alex saw as the truest version of herself. Like the fact that one of her closest friends was also black, that her new and favorite shoes were from Payless and only cost $18, that she had read everything that Toni Morrison had ever written, and that out of her group of friends, her and her husband actually had the smallest salaries. And Amira talks of how she knows a lot of Mrs. Chamberlain's, and you know a lot of women like this, you, you must do to write so well <laughs> this mentality. Explain a little bit about this virtue signaling that you see and this sort of, you know, well-intentioned, um, you, you call it overly accommodating women. Yes, I think the over virtu uh, virtual uh, signaling is exactly it. Um, I definitely, you know, from school to being raised in Arizona, which is a predominantly white state, I definitely met a lot of people who use the items around themselves to normalize their lives. And I think a lot of people do this um, when it comes to money and lifestyle where they think as long as I can be really kind and sweet to the people serving me, then I will be more deserving of exploiting their labor. I think that happens often. And, you know, Alex doesn't have a problem. I don't think communicating with black people. One of her friends is black. And I think that she has a really easy time, you know, connecting with people in the same class circle that she's in. But Amira, her class status is so different to Alex that she can't handle the fact that her life is so different and she doesn't have the opportunities. And so she overcompensates in these really cringeworthy ways and, you know, thinks that Amira will connect with her on them. And I think that a lot of people do this too, where they see people who are in low, positions of status or socioeconomic status. And they have this feeling that, you know, Amira is good because of her status. And if I can get her to like me, then that must mean that I'm good too. And what I think that that does, I mean, you're just not treating someone like a human. Mm -hmm. You know, you may get along, you may not get along, but you're not approaching them the way that you would approach anyone else. You know, and on top of all of that, Alex is her employer. I mean, I feel like my best bosses were just all about the work and didn't need to be my friend at all. And Alex doesn't realize that in her, you know, attraction to Amira and who she is, she's creating extra emotional labor for Amira to respond and be her friend and make her feel good. And, and that's not what she's paying for. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge contrast, I'm sure intentional, and you could tell me about it, between the scenes with Alix and Amira, which are very silent and stilted and, and awkward, and then the scenes when Amira is with her friends, and there's a much more feeling of, of freedom. And I think you've described the kind of very pur you know, real purpose you have there in that real, real diversity of those two situations. Mm -hmm. Yes, I feel... You know, I love showing people in private spaces and then in public spaces. And I'm so interested by the voices that we use in, in, you know, in every conversation, you know, from the way that I talk to my editor to the way that I talk to my best friends or, or even if I just like see a dog on the street, my voice is going to do different things. And so I wanted to highlight all of those, but also show, you know, for Amira, this is her job. And for many Black women, especially in the States, I think that there are levels of professionality that they want to maintain when they're with their jobs so that they can, they can stay there. And so, I mean, with her friends, at, sometimes they're partying, sometimes they're negotiating job you know, salaries and, and they know what they're doing, but the way that they're seen in, in public is very different. And Alex, you know, 
in both public and private, she's kind of a mess. She doesn't really know what she's doing. I think she does play it cooler than a lot of people can. I think that she has an air of coolness about her. Um, but the way that she communicates with Amira is so, like you said, stilted and, and awkward because she has another agenda. Um, but those are my favorite characters to write. I love characters that you want to shake them a little bit and they're not like, they almost have it, but they don't have it and it's just not going to happen. I've heard you say you love awkwardness. That's one of your favorite things to write about. What, tell me a little bit about that. There's something, I mean, I've always been really interested in language and the language that people use to, uh, to um, kind of, you know, relieve themselves of guilt in any way. And all of those awkward pauses or starts and stops or, you know, the language that they use is part of it. Um, but I also love using class indicators with that as well from Alex's Payless shoes. I don't know if Payless is in the UK or not, but things like that. Is it? No, I don't want to, I think it's bankrupt. Oh, now. Oh, I don't think, anyway, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> I love all of those little, you know, class indicators that are so telling. As soon as you see them, you're like, oh my gosh, I know a person like this, or I would use this, or I wouldn't use this for for whatever reasons. And so I think that all of the items that people own, their language, their, you know, their inflection on certain words, I think if you get it perfectly, it makes you cringe so much because it's so, you can hear it happening. And so I love when a person has to put a book back down because it's just too much. That's my favorite. And I, we can't spoil those moments, but there are very many moments in the book where you just, you're reading it, but you are, you, you the awkwardness is, is is very, very palpable. I mean, that sort of brings me to another part of, of we talked about people's reaction to it, but, and you and you want people to, to squirm a little bit, I guess. Yes, that's absolutely. You, that's my favorite, yeah. You want, well, you want people to squirm, so, but um, do you think, do you, do you have an intentional reader, for example, with this? Who, who are, you, are you thinking of someone that this is a type of reader or, or that this is essentially aimed at? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think that before the book came out, I considered that it would be a read for people from 20s to 30s because that was the two main characters' ages. But I've been really pleased to see that a lot of high schoolers um, love the accessibility of it. And then, you know, people who are in their 50s and 60s who also can connect to not feeling like they're where they should be in their life have connected to it as well. And that makes me really happy. Um, I think that there's... And accessibility with Briar as well. Everyone loves a three-year-old. I think that for those who don't know, I mean, the, the, the toddler. I mean, you write about very, very brilliantly oh, about her. And I think you can't not. There's a lot of warmth and and character in in Briar. But yeah, so people have have praised that characterization. I, yeah, I think that I think that people love seeing children as they are in the real world, which is not always the perfect rosy cheeked child who, you know, reveals a secret at the perfect moment or anything. I didn't want to use her as any kind of uh, literary plot device. And so I think that for some reason, the three-year-old made it more accessible. And so, yeah, I guess I definitely thought, I think every, you know, this is so trite, but like you want to, you know, write the book that you would like to read and I'm 32. And so I thought maybe around there, but I've been really pleased to see that it's a book that people read with their moms and whatnot. And so that makes me really happy. Do you think that, and I, of course, people see themselves in the story? And did did you in, did you intend for people to see the, themselves in the story in terms of, I suppose, maybe white women cringing, and also <laughs> the idea that I've heard you say perhaps at events that there's a, a sort of defensiveness amongst white people reacting to it, saying, you know, I'm doing my best. I, I feel like I'm being sort of persecuted. I'm trying really hard. They're sort of forming themselves as Alexes. Do you see that happening? Oh yes, I mean all the time. Um, that's what I think the magic of fiction is. It, it meets people in a place that is different from a think piece or an essay. You know, my first goal is that people get raptured in the story, but I love strong reactions. And if someone comes back at me, like, which has happened at reading saying, you know, just so you know, we're really close to our nanny or our nanny really is like family. Or, you know, when I was little, I babysat for a black family and I'm just like, okay, <laughs> that's fine. I think that those reactions are, are strange, but they mean that something got stirred up in that person and that person's working at something within themselves. And, and that's, and that's wonderful. Um, 
I think that as soon as my writing gets in any bit polemic at all, that it loses the magic. I just need to go in trying to tell a right story. Um, I don't know who I stole this from, but I teach it when I teach workshops. Um, if you treat a story like a triangle, you want to have the bottom layer be characters. You always start with people because if it's not about people, no one will care. And then the middle layer in the middle of the triangle is given circumstance. And the top little triangle is symbolism. And if you turn it over and start with symbolism, it'll fall over. And I believe that's true. Yeah. I believe if you go into a novel saying, I'm gonna write a book that you know makes rich white women feel bad, you're not gonna do that. And it's not gonna be a good story. Um, and so, you know, it's, even if they're mad, but they like the story, that's wonderful. I love any dramatic reaction. Um, and that's kind of my favorite thing in a book too. When I read a book and I say, oh man, this kind of reminds me of myself. Like, how do I contribute to this? So I'm happy when that reaction happens anytime. It's really interesting. So that the characterization and the story and the plot is obviously first and foremost to you, but it's the way of getting the message across because it's the way of drawing people in without kind of making them feel wary of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love, there's so many books that I can point to that I just got lost in it. And then months later, I, I thought about it differently and thought about my own role in those, in those issues. And so it's a strange place, you know, as a writer, the story is always the thing, but if you don't have something to say as a writer, you know, if you're a little bit shy about your own morals, I don't think it's going to work. And so it's this really tough balance between keeping the story first and also writing the world as you see it. And, you know, I think a lot of people, I'm not gonna give anything away as far as the ending is concerned. I've had, you know, some people will say, oh, I wanted, I wanted a happier ending. And, and I, my biggest concern was being really true to the black woman's experience at the end. And I think anyone who hasn't read it knows by now, you know, Amira doesn't win the lottery at the end of this book. She doesn't, you know, move into a mansion. She doesn't have any of those things. Um, and so that was the first priority. And, and that's where I tried to keep it. It's interesting, you say you want it to be, of course, true to the Black experience. There's been, you know, talk over the past year, I mean, there's always been talk about whether you can write about that experience if you're a, a white author. Do, do you think that they, that white authors can do that? Or do you, do you sort of, what do you think about that controversy around? I think that they can and, and, and do. Um, I think that Donna Tartt, my favorite nanny character in a novel, is from The Little Friend by Donna Tartt, which is wonderful. And that like that character sticks with me so much. Um, I think Curtis Sittenfeld has written some some black characters that really stuck with me as well. Um, I think as a writer, you can write from any perspective that you want. That being said, you have to do it perfectly because as soon as you are using characters of color is as a tool or as a way to make other characters you know look better, it's going to be problematic and. And people will come for you and, and you'll you'll have to deal with those situations. Um, I think the hard thing is, you know, the writing that I love, like I said before, it shows the world through the author's eyes, not the way that the author thinks that black people want to be seen. Mm. Um, it's it's so annoying to read black characters who are portrayed as perfect and these model minority characters because they have no flaws and that's just not human. And so as long as all of your characters are, are human, I think you can write about whoever you want. Um, but, you know, make sure you have a lot of readers and you get it perfect. And there's, there is more. Do you feel like this year in the recent years, there's, it's easier to get your sort of novel, you know, to get these things published now? Do, did you battle against it in any way? Um, I mean, I think every author uh, has gotten lots of rejections. As far as, you know, the stories from from black women it's been you know wonderful to see more getting more press that you know you could, people can find easier but at the end of the day i think it's important to look at the numbers of who's getting published and it's still 80 to 90 percent of white people getting published and so i think as soon as the numbers were reflective of the people writing that's when i would be really excited so i think we have a long way to go but i'm hoping we get there and one of the themes we haven't explored that you you touch on and you have touched on is this idea that um, it's obviously caregiving um, and the idea of how important that is and yet how little importance people seem to give it. In, in your book and actually 
funnily enough, in this time of crisis, it's a really important theme. I'm sure the same in the States, social care, uh, a very, very, you know, poorly pa paid jobs are the ones that turn out to be really some of the most important and most needed people in society. And people are always judging Amira, it feels like in the book, her closest friends, her boyfriend, and they, they're always encouraging her to, to take up a new job. And she, it feels, it's very relatable. She takes that on and she's signing up for all these new jobs with her heart not in it because she just wants to care for Briar. Do you think, why do you, why do you think, and I'm sure it's the same in the States, do you think childcare doesn't have enough value placed on it? That it oh my gosh, not at all. <laughs> I mean, childcare is so difficult. It takes such a strong and patient personality to be on at the level that's needed to really show a child care and discipline and love and all of those things. Um, I think at least in the States, I know it goes back to days of slavery where black women took care of white children because that was their only way of, of living. And so I think that the effects from that, keeping it a low status position um, is reflected in the fact that, you know, domestic caregivers don't have health care half the time that they get, don't get paid half as much. And I think we're seeing now is it's a, a essential job and people will complain so much about taking care of their children. And it's like, well, then why aren't caregivers being treated in the way that they should, which is, which is essential. Um, I think it's a really heartbreaking thing because, I mean, you can shape a child's life. You're partially raising them and, and they should be treated that way. And so Amira loves it and she's good at it. And I think that her, you know, satisfaction with that is a threat to her friends and, and Kelly and especially Tamara, who's another black woman who is a principal and she thinks, I think that she subconsciously thinks, not only are you holding yourself back, but you're holding all of us black people back from, from wanting more. When really, Amira's not doing anything wrong. She's a nanny. And I think that if domestic care positions like hers were treated like the important jobs that they are, there would be more steps to promotions and you know getting classes to be a better child giver and making sure they're placed with the correct families. Um, I absolutely think that more attention and funds should be put towards childcare. Do you, you know, in a way that unifies Amira and Alix because they both are left in this house on their own. There's very little presence from her husband. Oh yeah, I mean, where is he? Where's Peter? <laughs> He's nowhere to be found. And I think that that like happens in a number of different families where the responsibility of the child care is just put on the mother and it's, oh, you know, my friend recommended this babysitter. Here you go. And that's it. And they're just as much his children as they are Alex's. And I think that in the same way that Amira blames herself for not having a better job, you know, Alex blames herself for not being a better employer when the whole responsibility has been left to her. And it shouldn't be. And so I think that they're both really suffering from, you know, these patriarchal capitalism like systems um, that leaves them in charge of the children. I mean, the time that Peter has his moment is really at the beginning. You've described that scene. He comes to, to try and sort of save the day. But importantly, and I think we can say this without giving too much away, um, one of the kind of most important thing in the book is this is this video that uh, that they have of the moment. And we're very, very used to that. We see these videos on social media all the time, on Twitter and in our timelines on the news. And there's the general feeling that them going viral is a good thing. Um, it's bringing attention to the issues. But the book feels like it really questions that. Um, Amira is really protective about it. She doesn't want this video to be seen. It's very private, the issues of kind of privacy and and I suppose shame, I, I don't, I, I wonder whether you're saying you empathize with that, that actually you, these things shouldn't always be going public and being viewed by millions and millions of people all over the world. I think that for the people around Amira, their thought process is showing this video will be good for black people. And that in that thought process, they're not considering what would this one black person appreciate. Um, everyone has their different, you know, demons and issues and, and goals and everything. And in that moment, Amira is thinking, I am looking for a new job right now. I do not want this to be the video that comes up when people Google my name as I'm looking for a new job. And I think that I just wanted to give her the space to be someone who doesn't want that shown. She doesn't have the support system she wants. She's embarrassed about it. You know, I know for me personally, like the idea of being 
all over Twitter in a really vulnerable state where I'm yelling, no, thank you. Like I would not want it either. Just because, you know, when you're the most embarrassed and infuriated part, like I just don't know if I would trust the internet with that. Um, but maybe I would feel that way. Maybe I would feel, you know, I want justice served and this isn't okay. I think it was more of an emphasis on the fact that it is an individual choice and that person needs to be in charge of, of how they get their, you know, videos of themselves out or not. And unfortunately the people around her kind of don't, you know, include her feelings as much as they should. And I can't believe how quickly this time is going. And I know that there are questions piling up, but, but let me just ask you a bit about this very exciting screenplay. Did, did yeah. you hit it with any thoughts in your mind? I mean, it's very cinematic. Did you have that in your mind when you were writing it? Is that the way, you know, all writers write with something in the back of their mind thinking this might, this might hit the big screen? Oh, that's so funny. Okay, so, I mean, I love film. And so I'm sure that my love of film went into this book, but I did never in a million years could I have ever dreamed that it would be adapted. But when I was at the Iowa Writers Workshop and I came in for my workshop where they were workshopping, a, I think, 200 pages of this novel, my friend Frankie said, okay, I've cast your entire book so I can tell you who should play who immediately. And so I thought maybe it had a cinematic bend to it, which was really encouraging, but I never could have imagined this, but I'm really, really pleased. And you're working yourself now on the, the screenplay, is that right? I'm working executive producing with two really great teams. Um, and of course, you know, production is shut down right now, but we're still working and I'm excited to see what we can do. And, and what else is, is next for you? Are you working on any more novels or? I am working on novel number two, um, which at this stage means reading a lot of nonfiction and sending myself very strange and messy cryptic emails of things that I might want to write. Um, and I'm really excited to dive in more to class issues and, and relationships between women and all of those awkward moments. I'm sure they will make an appearance. They will come, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure they will. And this has been, this is a book club, essentially. This is the How To Academy book club, a little different from perhaps sometimes what we otherwise do. So I wonder if you could tell us, for some people this time at the moment, this lockdown is um, a time when they've never had less time to read and they're absolutely off their feet with well childcare or whatever it might be and other people uh, are lucky enough to find it at a time where they're able to to read more and especially to sort of escape into books i know that you've been doing a lot of book club online recommendations what what are what are your top sort of picks for the for the moment that you would recommend people people read and ooh okay well for a time like this where time itself almost seems like it's going on forever but moving slowly and quickly um i personally really love a little bit of absurdist short stories and especially it's kind of less of a commitment than a novel so that might help as well um david bartem's not short story the school is so wonderful there's a writer called megan martin who wrote a book called nevers and they're really tiny little prose sections and they're really great um, i love george saunders he's wonderful uh, James Baldwin is a big favorite of mine and his essays, Notes on a Native Son, are really wonderful too. Um, yeah, I would suggest short stories, just going to smaller literary journals like Diagram or Plowshares and saying, okay, I'm at least going to read these 20 pages and that's going to be my goal for the day. So yeah, I would suggest some shorts. You, you mentioned James Baldwin. Is he, who would be, who were your literary heroes or who model your writing on? Would you be able to say that there was anyone you particularly modeled your dialogue he's a huge it's so funny because all of my favorite writers i my style i feel like it's not like theirs but i'm so inspired by them uh, james baldwin for sure uh giovanni's room really hit me in a good place when i was in grad school uh, i loved him like i said donna tart was a really good one too i loved Anis Alyssa nutting's book tampa which is another really uncomfortable read uh, but it was very good and for this novel too i read uh leila slimani's the nanny so good. I mean, I love, I mean, you know, from the first page that there's a murder, which is like wonderful for me as far as a read goes. And she really captures the class dynamics of, of domestic workers in a really great way. So she's a favorite too. Okay. I'm going to, um, I'm going to just check out the question box, which, um, oh good. The first thing I see is I love this. How great. <laughs> Okay, so one of the characters that we haven't talked about all too much, but we, we can now because obviously, um, uh, he, he is going to come into it. It's her boyfriend, Kelly, who yeah. in many ways, um, am I right? It, it has it shares some of the things with Alix in the sense that he's trying to overprotect her and sort of trying to prove that he has this, uh, you know, black friends and, and um, he has this, they have similar, similar qualities. 
Uh, someone says here, um, have you come across men like Kelly? Or you, you describe him in the book as a white savior, I think. Um, you know, it's so funny. So many people said that, you know, this book was attacking the white savior. And I have to say that that was never an intention of mine. I, it was a lot more almost shallow. I wanted Kelly to be a really hot guy who thinks he's really <laughs> damn. Funny. He is definitely very, very appealing character in, 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 in loads of ways. And it's, someone says, have you come across though him in, in your own life? Is he an, amal an amalgam of different white men? Um, and then they say in brackets, in total transparency, I've only read half the book so far. That's totally fine. Um, yeah, I've definitely met characters, um, both male and female, who think that their approximation to Black people makes them a more interesting person. And I think that something else that happens with Kelly and Amir's relationship is the fact that he's seven years older and makes a lot more money than her. And so he can get a little bit condescending and, and too comfortable with her to this point where she has to say, wait a second. And it's hard because, you know, she's 25, she's not trying to get married. And she's like, this will be fun. This guy's hot. Let me see how this goes. And, and it gets a little bit more serious. Um, but I think most black people in the States have come across white people such as Kelly who get too comfortable to a point where they want to meet you on a, a black level, wherever that is. And I have to say that the reaction I think a lot of black people have is to do what Amira does, which is say, you know what, I'm gonna ignore that for now because I don't wanna make this even more awkward. We'll see if that comes back again. And so that's definitely something that Amira has to deal with. So I would say yes. I haven't met Kelly per se, but I've met Kelly's in my life. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that the, the prompting to, to bring him up. And I mean, more, more people are saying, you know, what helped you, I suppose, develop his character? Did anything specifically help you with developing his character? Mm. Um, I keep, I think um, Alex kind of helped as well, thinking of someone who Alex would have like, who really would have stuck in Alex's mind and, and not let her go in this way. Um, I remember my teacher, when I workshopped this novel, said that Kelly was like so tall and he had these huge hands that they kind of become stuck in your brain a little bit. And so I think that his large physicality was like a huge part of how he tries to meet people on their level. I don't know if you know, like when you meet someone taller and they kind of try and seem smaller a little bit. Um, I think that he does that with his whiteness too and tries to meet people where he thinks that they are. And so I'm not sure if there was a person um, that made me think of Kelly that way. But I will say, you know, a lot of black weddings or groups that I've ever been in, there's always that one white guy who thinks they're very down. <laughs> they will let you know. Um, I'm going to tell, so someone says they love the story triangle. I, I did too. And they were asking for the middle tier again, but I'm just going to tell that person that um, you can get this, this will, it's all been recorded. So you'll be able to, you'll be sent a link um, by the How To Academy tomorrow and you can, um, and you can and you can download that and, and go back and, and find it. But um, someone says, and, and you know, you've spoken a little bit about your uh, writing career in early days. And, and what advice they say would you give to someone writing their first book, um, especially with regards to fear of failure and also paying for writing classes and, and workshops? Whether you think they should do that? Oh my gosh, I have so much to say. I'm gonna try and do it so quickly too. Um, I think fail early and often. You will go back and delete and change so many things that there were so many chapters in this book that, you know, the way that I learned what it needed was by writing what it wasn't. So there were many chapters that I wrote from Amira's perspective and I was done and it was 20, 30 pages and reading them over, I thought, nope, this needs to be from Alex's perspective. And it seems in those moments like a failure because you have to scrap so much work, but that's all part of the process of learning what your story really, really needs. Um, as far as paying for writing classes, which are so expensive, I started asking for them for birthday presents. And so that really helped. You know, I think uh, two summers ago, my husband got me a writing class for my birthday and it's just one less thing that you have to worry about in that way. And so that's always a good one. Um, but I was working in coffee shops trying to pay for, you know, applications and things when I was doing this. It just depends on that person's, you know, position. I, I in so many ways, you know, I don't have children or, you know, a mental illness or anything like that, like holding me back. Um, but there's so many people who have like, you know, all of these very real things. And so it just has to meet you where you're at and you can comfortably write. Um, I would also say read all the time. Just keep reading, never stop reading. Whenever you get stuck with your own writing, go back to some of your favorites and see how they did it. 
Um, and one thing that really helped me too, I swear it's my last one, whenever I'm writing and I'm not sure what word I should use or sentence I should use, I don't get stuck anymore. I just put a little dot of like fix it later and I keep on going. Just keeping yourself moving is, I think, really, really helpful for your writing. And I'm so glad people are bringing up different characters because there is a, another intriguing character. I mean, as I said at the beginning, the, the characterization is so wonderful and there are so many fantastic characters. And Tamara, the Alix's friend, um, everybody is, as people are saying, you know, is she meant asking you to be a likable character? Someone says, I'm a black woman and wanted so much to like her, but I couldn't stand her by the end. <laughs> it was a really conflicting feeling. And uh, someone else says, can we please have a spin-off where we get to Mara's story? So I think she is quite an intriguing character because, you know, she marches Alix around, doesn't she? And she, her ideas for uh, improving Amira's life are quite hard to to sort of empathize with I mean yes I mean one I love when anyone feels so strongly towards a character so be it love or hate so that's wonderful um Tamara's she is a very interesting person who has I think really high respectability politics and she really thinks that there's a certain way to be and so you know like a lot of the other characters her intention is to help someone but she doesn't realize her intention to help someone is more make someone else like her and have her values, even though there's a lot more ways to live than to be, you know, a wealthy principal in New York City. Um, Tamara was really fun to write because I loved watching her try to meet Amira on her level and try and, you know, yeah. you know like this young person with her. And, and I think that a lot of white people have another black person in their class circle encouraging that behavior. And for Alex, you know, Tamara is the one that pushes her to help this person even more and, and kind of makes it even worse. Uh, but Tamara, you know, yes, I've met a lot of Tamaras in my lifetime. They're very difficult to be around, which Amir finds too, but more than anything, they make me squirm a little bit. So that's probably why I put her in there. Um, and we, and we, can't, we can't give away too much. Someone has a very interesting question about their personal experience. So they, there's a lot of references in the book to the fetishism. I mean, when you talk about, um, you know, this, this idea of kind of Kelly, whether he's, whether he's doing that or not, and whether Alex is doing that, Alex is doing that or not. But um, this person says, it's so obvious in the book, but not always obvious in real life. And a very kind of personal question about their, your advice to them about, I suppose they say dating, but I suppose it works with friendship in social circles when people cross the line and associate you with your, with your culture. Mm. That's so hard. That's a really important question. Um, I think that that's the thing about fetishization and, and, and racism when, when they combine is that someone who can really love and care about you can also be getting things that are inappropriate out of your relationship with them. And I think that that's almost scarier than overt racism. Like for Amira, she really has to decide, because I think Kelly, you know, really, really likes her. And I think Amira has to decide, does your, you know, attraction to me, you know, succeed, like exceed your, what you might be getting from this on a personal level. And so I think it's an individual um, decision depending on how that person is. Um, if, I think with anyone, if you see someone acting differently around you than they do around other people or using you for any kind of street cred in any way, that is a problem. I feel that the only person who can know those things are you. And, and if you feel uncomfortable with those things, I mean, get rid of them. There's a lot of people in the world. <laughs> and another character that people are bringing up in the questions is, is Briar, who we've, we've spoken about a little bit. Someone says, I love her the most. It's not, okay. not but she comes off the page. She's lovely. Was she modeled on, on children that you looked after? Um, and, and, and I suppose the relationship with her and her mother, is that something that you, you know, familiar with? Or, or where did you get the character of Briar from and write about it so brilliantly? Right. I mean, I did count once uh, how many families that I babysat for in New York City, and it was about 55. So I met a lot of different children, and I worked at a birthday party studio where I did parties for kids about seven to eight times a week. So I came in contact with a lot of very cute children, and I really learned about how serious and, and odd and sweet children can be. So I think that she might be an amalgamation of a lot of children that I met. I did babysit one little girl 
every Saturday for about two years. Her family was really lovely and she loved smelling tea bags. And so that is where that came from. Uh, it's so funny because she's, I think she's 11 now and she came to one of my readings in New York City and she was on her phone. I was like, oh my gosh, you're a grown person. Uh, you used to smell tea bags and I would watch after you. So that one for sure. Um and someone says, how do you keep, you touched on this a little bit before, but it's an interesting point is how you keep the balance between writing your own experience and writing fiction. Is it something, do you ever have to sort of check yourself in that? Mm, that's a good question. You know, there are so many writers who write auto fiction in a really beautiful way. I'm really not one of them. Um, I think other people's lives are so much more interesting than mine, but all the time I'll hear a child say something or, you know, if some, one of my friends says something and if I think that would be amazing to write, write a scene around, I'll put that, that quote into a scene and, and figure out the situation that would support that scene the best. I think it's really important to understand if, you know, if something happens to you and it's so funny and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to write about this and you write about it and you give it to a workshop and they're like, this isn't reading right. You can't say, but that's how it happened. You have to craft that scene so that it reads with the same impact. And that means changing things around a little bit. So I think the answer there is, is focusing on what works in the story the best, which isn't always what happened in real life. Um, and and another, uh, another person says, again, we touched on a little bit about the, the digital, the video and, and the kind of issues about whether it's a good thing or not that these things, you know, go viral in, in the digital age. But social media is, 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 a, is an important theme. Um, and Amira is, is She's not on Instagram. Every, no one can understand that. You know, Alix spends her whole time trying to find out about her life by going through her social media. And someone says, you know, they would expect her to have been. Was there a particular reason for her sort of being very hard to find online? Yes, absolutely. Well, the one funny thing is I do have a few friends that are not anywhere on Instagram or on Twitter. They just do not have time for it. And it kind of feels like, uh, you know, in the same way, okay, I've never read Harry Potter, any of them. And I feel like I just didn't do it when everyone else was doing it. So it's just not something that I was doing. And I feel like Amira is kind of with that, uh, with social media. But Amira, in a deeper level, is she thinks, well, what would I put on it? I can't put someone else's child on my Instagram. I don't have money to do any fun things. And I'm not super secure with where I am in life right now. And so I feel like Amira kind of sees herself as a before photo and she thinks when I get my life right, then I'll get Instagram and I'll have things to show like my friends do. So I think it's just another part of her insecurity about where she is at life. Yeah. Um, and, and, and somebody wonders whether you, did you model, you say you weren't Amira, have you modeled any of her friends on particular friends or do you try and keep it all very much fictional? Yeah, none of her friends were modeled after my friends. But I will say, it's so funny because people love to ask, you know, are you any of these characters? I think if I shared personality traits, it would be Briar. I need to know what's coming next, what's going on immediately. So Briar and I definitely have that nervous energy of wanting to know what's coming next. Um, but Amir's friends, I mean, I have a group text of women that I'm always communicating with as well. And my best friend, Christina, definitely, you know, when jobs became available she jumped up and down with me and so i've been really really lucky to have wonderful girl friendships so i would say that i'm definitely inspired by that certainly a book about powerful powerful friendships and they're both they are also incredibly important to Alix as much as they are uh, to amira um, and someone says one of the reasons they love the book is because as we mentioned it's funny and witty and a real lightness of touch in dealing with very serious issues um but it's so hard at the moment they say to find great comic fiction and, and wondered which other authors inspire you specifically in, in, in writing comedy? Comedy, that's such a good question. Uh, there's a book called Special Topics in Calamity Physics by Marissa Pessel, which I think is so funny. Um, kind of a wild card one. I love it when authors can admit what a mess they are. Uh, Kat Marnell's book, How to Murder Your Life, really cracked me up. Um, I'm trying to think who else really makes me laugh as far as comedy is concerned. I'm going to throw a TV show in there. The TV show Atlanta with Donald Glover made me laugh so much. And I, I think a lot of writers are inspired by scripts and TV scenes that they, that they see. And so those are definitely inspiring to me too. And the, uh, the workshop that, that you went to, someone was asking whether um, you could describe, obviously you went there to, to get your um, MFA, but what was it like workshopping a novel that deals with race and environment that is 
I'm assuming this person says predominantly white? That's a great question. Um, so I, the novel workshop, I mean, workshops are such a mixed bag and some of them, depending on the people there or the professors or whatever, you can have really good ones. And then some of them are, them are like, you're, you're dreading this every week. I got really lucky with my novel workshop um, because the teacher was wonderful. The people in the class were, were wonderful too. And there were two other black women um, in the class, which always, always helps. Um, I have to say that Iowa, as far as um, ethnicity is more diverse than you would think it is, but it's mostly, it's mostly white people in that way. And so I think it all depends on the professor. I had Paul Harding who writes about race in a really lovely way and really understands that you are describing the world as you see it. And so that was really wonderful. But I mean, I think every black writer has been in a workshop where someone says something where you just have to just go, that's not really, that's not really what I wanted to hear right now. But thankfully it was such a fun age that did not happen. Yeah. Um, I'm so, so grateful for, for you to coming and, and we're going to have to sort of wrap it up. But I was going to say some, some people are asking some questions about um, the title and, and various things that we mentioned at the beginning. So just, just to reiterate, um, the How To Academy will be sending everyone who's tuned in uh, a link to the event and also a link to where you can buy the brilliant book. And I've only just really registered that I was going on about this cover, but you have <laughs> behind you another equally um, fantastic cover, but they will be sending you a link so that you can um, go and, and click on that and go to the independent bookshop to, to buy the book. So I would really encourage you to do that. If you haven't had the treat of reading it already, I'm sure you can tell from the conversation, there's no reason not to, especially before um, you know, the film comes out, which I want to be able to see it in real life. So Kylie, thank you so very much indeed for joining us. Um, this was really you, lovely. Thank you so much. I really hope that you'll be back in person um, at some stage soon. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Have a good one.